Hello everybody and I hope you guys are having a wonderful day. In today's video on the respiratory system, we are going to be going over your respiratory objectives 15, 16, and 17. Yes, this is going to get a little bit involved and this is going to be probably the hardest part of the respiratory system. The part that sort of leans on chemistry the hardest and I know chemistry was not a prerequisite for taking A and P2. So bear with me here, I'm going to try to walk us all through it. But do bear in mind, this is probably going to be the longer, probably the longest video of your respiratory system, and it is going to get a little bit heavy. All right. So objective 15 is explain the differences in alveolar and atmospheric air composition. Objective 16, describe the transportation of oxygen in the blood and explain how oxygen loading and unloading is affected by temperature, pH, BPG, and carbon dioxide pressure. Objective 17 is describe carbon dioxide transport in the blood. Right? So yes, a little bit of this, if you guys remember all the way back to our blood unit long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, when we discussed hemoglobin and heme in your blood and how oxygen attached to red blood cells, we're going to be touching on that again tonight. Right? So basically, this is going to be your video on how air or oxygen and carbon dioxide transfers between the air you breathe in and liquid blood and the process by which this gas this gas exchange occurs right remember we're talking we're discussing all of this as it's happening inside the alveoli so remember you have the alveoli sac which is like a bundle of grapes except each individual grape is an alveolus here and inside each of these alveolus right they all have a duct leading to them, as well as a series of pores to maintain pressure between all of them and let air flow. They have macrophages and other immune cells within, just to ensure that in the event you do breathe in some germs, hopefully you don't get sick. And remember, these little air chambers, or this alveolus, also is lined with capillaries so that blood has easy access to each alveolus immediately where the capillary is. So you have capillaries here and it is but a single cell layer between the air that you have just breathed in and the blood that needs this oxygen in it. Right? So there's your reminder of anatomy for the deepest part of your lungs. Right? Also remember from previous videos that the pressure inside your alveoli is going to be the same as atmospheric pressure. So the pressure inside your alveoli is going to be the same as atmospheric pressure, so the pressure outside your body. So the goal is for the air pressure inside each individual of these alveolus to be the same as the pressure that is outside your body. So we need to start discussing how air and everything is different inside the alveoli versus outside of your body, right? Remember, Henry's law goes into effect here, right? Do you remember Dalton's law and Henry's law? For your quick reminder from our pressure video, Dalton's law tells us that pressures and partial attitudes of a total are the sum of its parts. Right? So that means the amount of pressure that oxygen has in the air you breathe in is based upon the percentage of oxygen in the air you breathe in. Dalton's law says that that pressure correlates to how quickly air can transfer between matter stages, like going from gas to liquid. Right? And we are indeed talking about alveolar air pressure and the ventilation of air going into the alveolus and how it is allowed to get into your blood through perfusion, right? This is what we are discussing, and we need to understand the air in your alveoli is a little bit different than the air in the world around you. 
right? The air inside your alveoli is going to have a little bit more water vapor in it, and it's also going to have more carbon dioxide in it than the air that is outside of our bodies. So when you start taking like atmospheric air percentages in total, right? There's less carbon dioxide in the air in the atmosphere than there is in the air in our bodies. That would make sense, right? Because our bodies intentionally make carbon dioxide as a waste byproduct. So we know we're going to have to deal with carbon dioxide and releasing it as a waste byproduct. But out in the open atmosphere, things like trees use the carbon dioxide because they breathe that in for photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide stays in the ocean as like a sink for carbon dioxide. And other stuff happens to it. So out in the atmosphere at large, there is less percentage of carbon dioxide than the percentage of carbon dioxide in the air that is in each of our alveoli due to the fact that we are making this stuff as our waste byproduct, right? So of course it's going to have a higher proportion inside us than outside us. Right? Due to Dalton's law and Henry's law, remember those, as we breathe in and change the gas composition in the air that we have breathed in, it makes the oxygen inside the alveolar air absorb into the bloodstream via small capillaries that line the alveoli. Right? So generally speaking, when we breathe in, the air, like we have breathed in new oxygen, that means the air that we have just breathed in inside the alveoli now has a higher percentage of oxygen in it, meaning it has a higher uh, pressure of oxygen in it, and that pressure enables the oxygen to transfer over into the blood vessels, right? So that pressure is allowing the oxygen to transfer this through this thin little wall here, into the capillary and then be grabbed onto by a red blood cell because that was the red blood cell's job. Right? So the partial pressure of oxygen inside your alveoli is roughly 104 millimeters mercury and the partial pressure of oxygen in deoxygenated blood is about 40 millimeters mercury. No, your body is never completely devoid of oxygen right? So even your deoxygenated blood still has a little bit of oxygen in it. It's just at a factor of comparing 104 to 40, so like 60% less than what it would have had, right? Uh, which is substantial because this is how your cells get oxygen and are able to do their thing, right? Your cells need oxygen to make energy. Um, Remember in life, liquids and gases flow down the pressure gradient to where there's not a lot of pressure. So this makes it easier when you have breathed in and you've raised the partial pressure of oxygen inside this alveoli. That makes it easier for the oxygen, oxygen to then transfer into the bloodstream. Because you're going from an area where you've just increased the partial pressure of oxygen in this alveolar air sac, but the partial pressure here is 60% less than what it was when things tried to reach equilibrium. So of course that's going to help the oxygen transfer over through that one cell layer thick to be grabbed up by those heme groups inside the red blood cells, bind to the iron in them, and then be carried away. That is the goal of all of this. So the goal is for the oxygen in your deoxygenated blood to be so much less than the partial pressure of oxygen in the air that you've breathed in to help facilitate the transfer of oxygen just going from the air to being sucked into your capillaries getting attached to the red blood cells, right? And you have some help with this. Oop. There is a little bit of help done with this, right? We all know how difficult it is to just go from, to make something go from liquid to gas or vice versa, right? 
All of us have experienced this even when we're making mac and cheese at home because we can't instantly boil water and turn it from liquid to gas, right? And here we are attempting to make something go gas to liquid and back and forth with every breath we take. We know that energy is involved in this. We know other things. That transfer does not happen magically and immediately, right? So there's a little bit of help with this. You do. Um, your alveoli right, actually create a liquid protein complex and substance to line the inside of these alveoli called surfactant. Right? Surfactant is a detergent-like lipid protein complex inside alveolar cells. Um, or that alveolar cells make to cover themselves and these capillaries with. Right? The surfactant is going to aid in transferring oxygen and carbon dioxide between air and liquid. So the entire purpose of this lipid protein little liquid film that your alveolar cells create and that is coated the inside of your alveolus the purpose of it is to help transfer carbon dioxide and oxygen easily, right? This is also going to help in preventing the alveoli from collapsing. We know how much stronger liquids hold their, especially lipid-based things in water, hold their structure better than just air does, right? You've seen water droplets keep their shape Whereas, you know, air doesn't really do that. Um, so we know that surface tension is a rather strong force in chemistry and nature. This is why small bugs can actually run on top of water. They use that surface tension to not fall through the surface, right? So the purpose of surfactant helps your alveoli not collapse because it's taking advantage of surface tension. And it helps act as an intermediary for oxygen and carbon dioxide to pass back and forth between the red blood cells. So surfactant is super important, right? And we haven't been through the reproductive system and that kind of thing yet, right? But among the last couple of organs that form in a fetus are the lungs. Because when baby is inside mom and, mom and they're getting oxygen via mom's blood and the umbilical cord, baby doesn't need to focus on developing their own lungs. So lungs tend to not be fully developed until later in the third trimester. This is why preemie babies are generally watched very closely and put under tough scrutiny in concern with their breathing and that kind of thing because they don't have fully, preemie babies do not have fully developed lungs yet, right? So premature babies may not have actually made the surfactant quantity or a sufficient quantity of surfactant that they need inside their lungs to keep this bad stuff happening or from happening, right? Um, if a premature baby or a baby is born without the ability or without having produced enough surfactant for itself, a lack of this can actually cause infant respiratory distress syndrome, which is something that your doctors will take very, very seriously, and they're going to watch that because no one wants their infant's lungs to just stop working, right? So... The entire lack of surfactant in a newborn or premature baby may actually cause infant respiratory distress syndrome, and that can be a leading reason why your infant, your preemie infant, may have to stay in the NICU for a little bit, right? So, back to the chemistry of all of this, right? We've been through this lovely stuff. We've discussed the partial pressures. Oxygen is then going to attach to the hemoglobin that is in those red blood cells. Remember our blood unit notes for that entire process and the chemistry behind that. And it's brought to the tissues that require oxygen. Right? Yay. Inside the alveoli, 
carbon dioxide's partial pressure is roughly 40 millimeters mercury. In deoxygenated blood, carbon dioxide's partial pressure is higher, right? Um, because it's deoxygenated, there's going to be more carbon dioxide in it because carbon dioxide is the waste we make. It can, like, normally it balances out at roughly 45 millimeters mercury, right? I know that's not much of a difference, but that is going to passively leave the blood and is re-released back into the alveoli to be exhaled then. So that little five degrees of pressure difference is enough for carbon dioxide to passively be re-released back into the alveoli so that you can exhale the carbon dioxide out. So your body not only detects your oxygen levels because we all know that you need oxygen to breathe and like you detect your oxygen levels to know, hey, I'm running too hard. I need to breathe harder so that my increased heart rate can deliver oxygen to my muscles so I can keep running. We know that your body detects your oxygen levels and you need oxygen to go. But your body is also going to detect your carbon dioxide levels, right? And your body detects these both of these levels, right? So it can change. Oh, I went one too far. Here we go. So here we go. Your body detects both your oxygen levels and your carbon dioxide levels so that it can help you and your ventilation process, right? And it detects these inside the alveoli, right? When alveolar oxygen is high, the little arterioles leading to the capillaries that are around the alveoli are going to dilate, right? When your alveolar oxygen is low, the arterioles that are leading to the capillaries that go around your alveoli, when oxygen levels are low, the arterioles are going to constrict, right? So when oxygen levels are high, the arterioles that are bringing blood itself to your like to, to your capillaries around the alveoli, when oxygen levels are high because you have too much oxygen, the arterioles are going to dilate, allowing more blood to flow through faster. When oxygen levels are low, it's the arterioles are going to constrict. That's going to slow down the blood flow in the hopes that in slowing down the blood flow, the red blood cells will then be around those capillaries and the alveoli long enough to snag more oxygen, right? So when your oxygen levels are messed with, the arterioles and the blood vessels respond to that in an effort to either incre like increase flow rate or decrease flow rate to give more red blood cells time to collect more oxygen, if that makes sense, right? <coughs> From the opposite perspective, though, from the opposite side of things, your actual respiratory system, the bronchioles and your bronchial tubes, right, respond based more so on the carbon dioxide levels than your respiratory levels. So when alveolar carbon dioxide levels are high, the bronchioles are going to dilate, and they're going to dilate in an effort to widen the tubes to allow more air to pass in and out because you have high levels of carbon dioxide. That means you have high levels of waste inside you. So the bronchial tubes are going to dilate in the hopes that you can push more waste out faster if the tubes are open, right? But when the alveolar carbon dioxide is low, the bronchioles are going to constrict a little bit. They're going to tighten up to decrease the flow of air. That way, they can maintain the partial pressure gradient in attempting to keep that partial pressure in here 
of carbon dioxide at an equilibrium to make the deoxygenated blood that flows in want to give up more of that carbon dioxide so that oxygen, when you breathe in and the partial pressure of oxygen increases, can easily transfer over and like go into your blood and be snagged by the red blood cells. So your respiratory system responds to your carbon dioxide levels more as far as if they dilate or constrict your bronchioles and tubes, whereas your cardiovascular system and the arteries and like arterioles that lead to the pulmonary circuit are responding more to the oxygen levels in things. That way the two systems can hopefully balance each other out. Right? By collecting all of that data and both of those systems working together, that's how your body artificially creates a higher oxygen partial pressure inside the alveoli so that it can force oxygen's diffusion into your bloodstream. Right? Carbon dioxide, just by chemistry and by nature of things, you can double check this with your chemistry teachers, is more water soluble than oxygen is. And it does need that little bit of help, right? Because carbon dioxide is more water soluble, meaning it wants to stay with your blood plasma more than the oxygen does. Um, and it, yeah, and car your carbon dioxide levels don't need that help in maintaining the partial pressure. Oxygen levels, though, do. So you can breathe easier. Right? That, for those partial pressures are super important for being able to maintain breathing in and out. And sometimes our bodies have diseases that in enable enables the wrong word, inhibit our abilities to maintain partial pressures, right? This is why sometimes there are hyperbaric treatments for some illnesses. If you remember, right, um, from any medical history classes or things you've met, there are these pictures. This is polio treatment because one of the many side effects of polio, which is a virus, um, a virus that sort of hit humankind decently hard because of our own waste byproducts and how urban environments started growing up at the turn of the 1900s, um, polio became an ever-increasing issue 150, 100 years ago, right? And one of the things that polio does is it inhibits our ability to maintain those itty bitty little partial pressures and it also can partially paralyze your muscles so you can't breathe as easily which affects your partial pressures right um that's bad right so a cure for polio way back when or some people that need this was to be put in a device right here called a hyperbaric treatment or a hyperbaric tube um, they are also commonly called iron lungs, right? That was a treatment for polio way back in the day. Nowadays, we invented a vaccine for polio, and most people in the United States have been vaccinated against polio, so this is not a concern that we have in our first world nation. However, polio is increasing with the anti-vax movement, and we never fully cleared it or killed it off on the planet. It's not like smallpox. So polio is still an issue in some countries like Pakistan and other underdeveloped areas of the world. Although the WHO is the World Health Organization is greatly trying to spread polio vaccines and eradicate this disease. There is one man in America um, who still actually has a functioning iron lung. He is a lawyer, and he has to sleep inside his iron lung every night. Um, I think his documentary is on Netflix, but he, there is one elderly gentleman left in the United States right now, um, as I am filming this in 2020, that still does use an iron lung and 
he's actually having some issues because the companies that used to make iron lungs no longer really make them now. So he's having difficulty finding parts and repairing his iron lung, which I can't imagine that level of stress in your life just to breathe. Um, but yeah, other things can affect that partial pressure gradient, like infections or carbon monoxide poisoning. This is why some households have a carbon monoxide uh, detector in them. If that goes off, get out of the house. Because if you are breathing in too much carbon monoxide, that is going to 100% throw off these partial pressures. And that's inevitably what would end up happening would be the same thing as if you stayed in your garage with the car running, you carbon monoxide yourself, and then you suffocate yourself because there's not enough oxygen. Um, don't do that. Either, yeah, definitely don't do that. Um, and if you have carbon monoxide detectors in your house, do what you do with fire detectors. Keep the batteries changed, please. And if they go off, just call the, call the appropriate authorities. Get out of your house so you can breathe easy. Otherwise, don't just pass away in your sleep from something like that. Right? So the rate of gas exchange in your blood that we're talking about um, is determined by a number of different factors in your life. A number of different things that can affect this, right? Uh, temperature affects this. Slower or colder temps. Um, we all know how gas molecules work, or maybe not. If you haven't had chemistry, you may not. Um, Think about your gas molecules being excited, and that's sort of what temperature is. The higher the temperature, the faster the molecules are moving. Uh, so that means things will, like, all of these gas molecules will transfer into your bloodstream slower at colder temperatures, whereas they will go a little bit faster at warmer temperatures, right? Um the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide already present in both inside you and in the air you're breathing are going to affect this. This is why when somebody's having difficulty breathing, one of the first treatments in the hospital may be to put the person on an oxygen tank to sort of stack the deck in their favor and get them more oxygen, right? Um, it can also depend upon your concentration of biphosphate glycerol inside your body. Um, we'll talk about that one a little bit later. And your blood pH. Remember your blood be your ideal blood pH from our blood unit was 7.35 to 7.45, right? The more acidic your blood is, the less oxygen can diffuse into it. And the worse oxygen binds to your hemoglobin. I know that seems weird, um, but acidic substances and acids have more hydrogen molecules in it and as we remember from basic biology or chemistry if you're trying to mix oxygen in a solution that has a lot of hydrogen in it you're going to get more water you more literal water molecules in there so if you have very acidic blood for whatever reason whatever you have done to yourself that made your blood go slightly acidic um it's going to mean that any oxygen that your body's attempting to breathe in is creating more blood plasma and liquid water as opposed to more readily attaching to your red blood cells in those heme groups, right? So the more acidic your blood is, the less oxygen is going to diffuse into your blood and red blood cells and the less likely it is to bind with inside your hemoglobin. Right? So you definitely do not want a lot of acidic blood. As a matter of fact, this is one reason, if you remember in chemistry, pH is a scale going 1 to 14. Pure, perfect water is a 7 and neutral. The lower the numbers are, it's more, the closer to 1 it is, it's acidic. The higher the numbers are closer to 14 is basic. That simple fact right there is one reason why our blood is slightly basic. It's not a pure 7, it's a 7.35. Right? If your blood gets too acidic, it can be bad for this. 
But that brings us to how carbon dioxide is transported amongst all of this, right? And there are some weird names for this, right? So if oxygen is attached to the hemoglobin, we call that oxyhemoglobin, because that's a fast way for chemists to tell you what the hemoglobin is currently carrying, right? But when we start talking about carbon dioxide, it gets a little bit crazier, if I can put it that way. Um, this is probably the fancier and more frightening look of this, right? We know that hemoglobin was designed to be able to grab a hold of oxygen. We know that it had iron in it to want to grab oxygen. But hemoglobin does not as readily attach to carbon dioxide, right? It can carry carbon dioxide, don't get me wrong. It can catch and carry some of that carbon dioxide. But it doesn't do that as readily as the hemoglobin will carry red blood cells, right? So what ends up happening is within your bloodstream, Carbon dioxide does not attach to your hemoglobin as easily as oxy oxygen does. So your red blood cells are going to help um, create this carbino car carbamino hemoglobin, and they're going to help this hemoglobin or the carbon get back to the lungs. Um, through this complicated chemistry cycle here. Remember, Hb is hemoglobin, hydrogen is hydrogen, and they are going to convert a decent amount of this carbon dioxide that came into here. This one is just carbonohemoglobin right here. However, the fastest way, instead of hanging on to a few, it, it will hang on to a few, but the fastest way your red blood cells have of dealing with this is instead it's going to allow the carbon dioxide to just kind of hang around the heme groups and it's going to combine with extra water from blood plasma and that sort of thing and when it does this it is going to create carbonic acid which almost immediately then breaks up into bicarbonate right and this bicarbonate just sort of freely floats in your bloodstream, right? And your red blood cells are going to anhydrize this carbonic acid here into some hydrogen that it will need for itself and bicarbonate. Right, that bicarbonate in and of itself is going to just travel outside of your red blood cells within your blood plasma with everything else. Right? You guys know what bicarbonate is. It's chalk. It's what's in Tums pills when you have heartburn and you need to take that. Um... Bicarbonate is a very basic substance, and it's also how our bodies immediately convert from tissue cell tissue, the carbon dioxide that we develop as waste and give to the red blood cells. It's how we almost immediately and quickly deal with all of that influx of carbon dioxide as your red blood cells are just handing over the oxygen to the tissues to use the tissues as it need be, right? That bicarbonate is what makes your blood slightly basic. It is the thing that makes blood slightly basic in it, right? Um, it's also what your body detects in your blood to detect if you have high blood carbon dioxide levels or low blood carbon dioxide levels, right? Um, and as this pumps back to your lungs, when it, you get back to your lungs, right, um, it is going to convert back into carbon dioxide 
in the alveolar capillaries and then diffuse from those capillaries into the alveolar air so that it can be exhaled. Right? But essentially, your red blood cells not only just grab and carry oxygen to the tissue cells that need it, it does some fancy juggling around with some molecules with the carbon dioxide because it can't carry carbon dioxide as easily. And you have the chemical formulas here on the screen in front of you. I know this looks confusing as heck. And I know if you are one of my students that hasn't taken chemistry yet, this probably looks like a nightmare. Um, I, I won't sugarcoat that. You do not have to have these formulas memorized. Please don't freak out. Right? Um, but basically... Your red blood cells are going to hang on to some of the carbon dioxide as much as they can. And what they can't hang on to, it quickly converts in a two-step process into bicarbonate, which, which can just travel in blood plasma next to the red blood cell and float along with your red blood cells as bicarbonate, where it will then, in the alveolar capillaries, quickly convert back from being bicarbonate into carbon dioxide where it will be exhaled. Right? So your red blood cells are going to do some decently fast chemical juggling here to compensate and accommodate for all of the carbon dioxide waste that your bodies make as it trades oxygen for carbon dioxide. Right? But this also means you are always going to have a little bit more carbon dioxide and of this bicarbonate inside your body than you do oxygen levels as far as, like, blood supply goes. Right? That's the way things are supposed to work. Because this is what makes your blood slightly basic so that it can continue to do this switch. It's what allows your blood to stay slightly basic to enable this oxygen to easily attach to the hemoglobin. And this is also one of the things that your brain detects when, when, when telling your body when you need to breathe in and out. When, you, when your body is doing its every moment chemical checks to see what you need to continue surviving. Right? There are a couple of illnesses that can go wrong and things can happen with this though. Right? So there is some stuff that can happen with all of this. Um, right? Only about 20% of your carbon dioxide is actually attached to the hemoglobin when it's transported to the lungs. The rest of it gets there via that uh, bicarbonate that we were just talking about and does its fast conversion when it's there. Right? Um, but if all of this is out of whack and things don't 100% work correctly, there are a couple of terms we need to understand, right? Respiratory alkalosis, alkaline means basic. So if we are talking about respiratory alkalosis, that's when you have too much bicarbonate built up inside your blood from this and your blood is becoming becoming too basic because of the amount of bicarbonate that's building up, right? This kind of thing can be chronic or acute, meaning it could be a legitimate disorder or illness that you have with your lungs and breathing, or it could be acute and caused by something and come on rather suddenly, right? This, uh, this state of respiratory alkalosis can also be caused by hyperventilation, right? Weirdly enough, though, hyperventilation it can also be a symptom of whatever illness may be causing this if it was not the cause. So if you are hyperventilating and you are breathing inside a, a, you know, a brown paper bag like they used to give people whenever you were hyper hyperventilating, you can acutely and temporarily cause yourself to have respiratory alkalosis for a little bit, right? However... If you have a different illness that is the underlying cause of the respiratory alkalosis, it can also cause you to hyperventilate. Um, so, yay, fun diagnostic information for you right there, because you have to listen to your patients and things are situational. 
right? Um, on the flip side of the coin, respiratory acidosis is when the bicarbonate and carbon dioxide build up so much in the body that it doesn't complete this final step here and it stays carbonic acid. If you just have so much carbon dioxide as waste product building up in your bloodstream that it is combining with the free-floating hydrogens in your blood plasma and whatnot, and it is creating carbonic acid, that's bad. <laughs> that's super bad for you. And that's going to make your blood, because of whatever respiratory issues you're having, become more acidic, right? Um, and that makes the bloodstream too acidic because of this carbon dioxide buildup which is very bad for you and your ability to survive. Because as we've mentioned, not only does your blood not need to be acidic, that's going to make oxygen bind with your red blood cells less. So you're going to be starving some cells of oxygen while dealing with the fact that your blood has too much carbon dioxide or carbonic acid in it, and you've switched sides to being too acidic. That's dangerous. Uh, that can be very dangerous. Um, not good for you at all, right? So your body wants to detect the amount of carbon dioxide levels you have in your blood and tell yourself to breathe and account for that accordingly, which is why your body does tap and track your carbon dioxide levels so closely. It wants to keep track of that. It wants to maintain those levels. There you go. Um, right. All right. If you have any questions about this, please let me know. I know this was a more chemistry heavy episode for you guys, and I know it slightly hurts your soul. Um, but please let me know if you have any questions and I hope you have a wonderful day.